Let's open tonight to a new study. We are going to open to the book of Exodus. We're going back into the Old Testament, back into that book that falls right on the heels of our study of Genesis that we completed just a few weeks ago. And I really struggled with where to go after our, our short study through Jude, but I just kept coming back to this desire to continue the narrative that we left off with in Genesis, because really Genesis kind of leads us at an incomplete place. Because in Genesis, we're confronted with the sad condition that sin brings. In Genesis, we see that the tragic result of turning away from God's design that's brought when we reject his commandments. And Genesis even ended with the ultimate result of sin, which we know is death. As we read of the death of Joseph, as great, as faithful a man as Joseph was, the effects of sin still touched even his life. But Exodus shows us that God wasn't done. God was going to provide a way out. As it's been put, Exodus is God's answer to man's need and supply for our sin. In fact, the very name Exodus in the Greek means way out. Now, on, on the most obvious level, it's the way out of the physical slavery that the children of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, would receive from the cruel taskmasters of, of Egypt. How God would, would take them out and then establish them as his people, teach them how to live as a called out people. You know, one very simple way to, to break down the book of, of Exodus is chapters 1 through 14 give us the rescue of God's people, and chapters 15 through 40 give us the response by God's people. Here's what God did for them and bring them out, and then here is how they were to respond. But of course, what's most important for us is not to lose sight of the fact that what God did on the most obvious level was to be for the Jewish nation then and to be for you and I now a picture of the greater rescue that God would bring and ultimately the greater response that should follow. We see in these chapters of Exodus God's plan to, to rescue his people from the sin that tainted this world and their lives that began in Genesis, but it was ultimately only a shadow of the true rescue, the true redemption, the ultimate way out that God would provide for our sin once and for all through Jesus in the gospel. And so what we read up here in, in Exodus, it really gives us such a, a, a richness to what's been provided for us in the gospel. Because what's been done for us in becoming a Christian and being born again is so illustrated in this Old Testament book. The rich, deep theological concepts we read of Paul writing about in the New Testament of this eternal transaction that's taken place in our lives are illustrated for us here in Exodus. Our redemption, our deliverance, our transformation of life that we've been called into. When we get into the New Testament, those aren't just things that existed in a vacuum. Those aren't just new concepts that, that Paul kind of came up with. All of those flow out of and are built upon what God did and established here in this Old Testament book. And so studying this book really allows us to see and understand and appreciate the gospel in much greater ways. Yes, we're reading of Israel's story, but we're also reading of our story. Yes, we're reading of Israel's redemption, but ultimately we're reading of the eternal redemption that would be found in Jesus. And so let's pray, and we'll jump in to this first chapter. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to take a new journey um, through your word. Lord, very, very familiar truths, very familiar stories. But Lord, we're just asking that you would speak fresh truths to our, to our hearts, Lord. And just reminding us of fresh and anew. As we look at what you did for the nation of Israel, of ultimately the picture it is for us of what you have done eternally for every one of us in this room through Jesus. And so speak to us now, and we ask it in his name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Notice the first few verses of Exodus chapter 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. For Joseph was in Egypt already, and Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation. So, so as Exodus begins, there's a very clear connection we see here with what's just come before us in the book of Genesis. In fact, the very word that's translated now in the New King James in verse 1 of chapter 1 
can also be translated, maybe it is in, in, the, in the Bible you're reading, as the word and, which makes this continuation even clearer. And we're reminded that during this great famine, the seven-year famine that swept through the land of Egypt and even went into neighboring Canaan, that Joseph, as second in command in Egypt, had reached out to his father and his brothers after making himself known to them and brought Jacob along with his other 11 brothers and their families to the land of Egypt and settled them in, in the best part of the land, the land of Goshen. And there he had ministered to them and, and gave them of the grain that he'd stored up during the seven years of plenty. And amazingly, during these horrible years, this family was greatly provided for. This family was shown great favor from Pharaoh himself. Again, all because of their connection to Joseph. But once the famine was over, this family didn't leave Egypt. They remained. And they even remained after the death of Joseph and after the death of all of his brothers, their children, and the, and the generations to, to follow them continued to stay in Egypt. And they didn't just stay, but as we're told now in verse 7, they grew and they multiplied. In, verse, in fact, verse 7 makes it sound like they multiplied like bunnies. Notice what it says. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. You think Moses wanted to get across the idea that the family got quite large? I mean, how many different ways can you say it, right? They were fruitful. They increased abundantly, multiplied, grew exceedingly mighty. The land was filled with them. We get the point, Moses. These got, they exploded in terms of their numbers. Now, you'll find a little difference of opinion out there on this, but it seems somewhere between 300 and 350 years of time have passed between Joseph's death at the end of Genesis to what we're picking up with now here in the book of Exodus, which means there was plenty of time to have a population boom. But even with all these years, I believe we are to ultimately see more than just biology taking place here. I believe Moses by the Spirit wants us to recognize God's supernatural hand in this fruitfulness. And this is God's hand of favor on his people, even in this foreign land. This is essentially God doing what he promised Abraham he would do. Remember back in Genesis 15, God takes Abraham out on a, on a clear night where he can see the stars. He says, Abraham, look up. Count the stars if you can. If you, if you can count that high, Abraham, this will be the number of your descendants. I know right now, Abraham, you don't have one child at home. But Abraham, I'm promising you, not only are you going to one day have a family, Abraham, you're going to have a nation. And God had made a promise. And what we see is that God, just as he always does, honored that promise. Now, in that same chapter in Genesis, Genesis 15, you recall God told Abraham, though this great growth wouldn't happen in the land he was currently in. It wouldn't happen in the land of Canaan. It wouldn't happen in the land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants. God said this, Genesis 15 and verse 13. He said, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land that is not theirs and will serve them. And they will afflict them for 400 years. And then down in verse 16, God went on to say, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. You know, sometimes we wonder, why did God take them out of the land they were already in to grow them? Why put them in a foreign land? And then have to get all these, you know, millions of people back into the land. Well, there's a couple reasons. One reason is because Canaan was too big for these 70 to grow into. Over all this time, it would have been very easy for the Jewish people to be assimilated into the culture of the Canaanites, lose their distinctiveness, lose their uniqueness, just get blended in with all these other people groups. And so God took them to Egypt. And not because Egypt was a, a perfect place or wasn't a pagan place. No, but because the, Egypt, the Egyptians stayed away from other cultures. And so they could grow here and they could keep their identity and they could remain distinct. They could remain separate. And once they were big enough, then they could go back and feel the land. But not only did this have to do with the people of Israel, but it also had to do with God taking them to a different nation with the people of Canaan. Because as the Lord said back in verse 13 of Genesis 15, 
It wasn't time for the people of the land's judgment. Yes, they were on track for a big spanking because of their behavior, because of their attitudes, because of their, of their actions. But it wasn't yet. God was still giving them time to change, to turn. Now, those are both reasonable explanations for why God would have them spend such a long time in Egypt. But there's also something else God told Abraham that, that we read there back in verse 13 of Genesis 15. And that is that while they were in this land, they wouldn't just have a time of luxury, but in fact, they would serve those of the land. And not only would they serve them, but those in the land would afflict them for 400 years. Now, as we saw in Genesis, J Joseph and his brothers had it pretty good when they came into the land. Right? I mean, they had the best the land had to offer in terms of raising their, their livestock. Pharaoh even hired them to take care of his livestock. They had their brother as the CFO. Right? It wasn't a bad gig. I can imagine them saying, you know what, God, we, we could hang out here as long as you want. Take your time with those Amorites. Give them a few more hundred years. But again, God had made very clear to Abraham, these conditions wouldn't last. And here's the point now in verse 8, where their situation drastically changed. It says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, there's a lot of debate out there, people trying to figure out who was this king, who was this pharaoh. Um, some say it was Amos, some say it was Amihotep I or Thutmos I. I'm probably butchering their names. Some say it wasn't even an Egyptian at this time. Some say this was a point in Egyptian history where a, a foreign ruler actually ruled over the land. But the point is, we aren't told. Because the issue is not who this ruler was, the issue is his attitude towards Joseph. And that is, he had no respect for his life. What Joseph had done for the nation was not on his radar anymore. He didn't look at this people and think, wow, we owe their ancestor in such great ways. No, he looked at this people and he said, we've got a big problem. In verse 9, and he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. He calls in his cabinet and he's like, have you guys seen the latest census numbers? Have you seen what's been happening? You see how big this people group has become. We better get together and we better enact some new legislation. Otherwise, if our enemies come into the land and these Hebrews link up with them, we're done for. We're through. Or they may leave. They may take off, and we're going to have to you know, take a serious hit to our economy. And so here's the plan, verse 11. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. And so as a result of this threat, a result of this situation, they get together and they enact some new labor legislation. Well, in this case, it didn't have anything to do with raising the minimum wage. It was actually just the opposite. They tightened down the screws. They put them to hard labor, forced labor. They made them work for the government. Essentially, they made them their slaves. And again, remember, these are God's people. These are the ones he had made great promises to. And all the while, they've been incredible citizens. Again, their ancestor had saved this nation. If it wasn't for Joseph, Egypt would have been wiped off the face of the map. Sure wouldn't have the status that they had. So they're not here suffering for some wrong they've done. They're not suffering for some rebellion they've, they've caused. They are suffering for their obedience. They were simply in the place God called them to be. But even though they were called here, remember... God didn't want them here forever. And as we mentioned, it would have been very easy to get comfortable here in Egypt after all these years. Think, let's just stay put. I mean, look how we are booming. Look how good things are going for us in this land. Yeah, we know there was something. We've heard some story about we're supposed to go to this land of Canaan. That's our promised land. 
We know there's something about we're supposed to take, you know, great, great granddaddy's Joseph's back to that land and bury him. But I mean, come on, there's plenty of good burial places here. Right, let's just stay put. Life's going smoothly. Look how blessed we are. And even though it's absolutely clear that the enemy was trying to destroy the seed God promised back in, in the Garden of Eden, we'll touch more on, on that in a moment, because we need to recognize something. And that is God was sovereignly using this hardship. That which was totally unfair. That which was so wrong. But God in his sovereignty was using it to stir up and prepare his people to move. To allow them to see that what this world offers is only bondage. In order that they would learn how much they need to reach out to him. Now, we hate affliction, right? We, we hate hardship. At least I do. Maybe you're weird. I don't know. But according to the scripture... It is often one of God's favorite methods to wake us up and grow us and shape us and move us for what he has for our lives. The psalmist put it this way in Psalm 119 and verse 67. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. I think so often we don't realize how much we need the Lord until we find ourselves under affliction until we find ourselves being treated unfairly or taken advantage of or, or suffering for no apparent reason. There's a humility that takes place in our hearts when we find ourselves in that place that causes us to realize, you know what? This world, no matter how well I may be having it here, it's not where it's at. Egypt is not where I belong. And though it's hard, and though it's unfair, and our flesh hates it, and what we learn here from the nation of Israel is that we have a God who loves to use affliction to grow his people. And we see that's exactly what he does in verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. Again, so often we go through affliction, and our response is, this is going to kill me. I'm, I'm going to go under. I'm, I'm going to drown here. I'm not going to make it through. I'm going to lose my mind. And yet, all the while, the reality is God is using it for just the opposite. We think it's going to destroy us, and he's using it to grow us, to make us stronger, to make us more fruitful, to multiply the impact that we can make. We see this in the book of Acts, don't we? The same principle. The early church. These, these men who were harassed, they were persecuted, they were thrown in jail. We read of James being killed with the sword by Herod in Acts chapter 12. And yet in the midst of all of this, Acts 12 ends with these words. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And even back in, in Acts chapter 8, remember Paul's great persecution wreaking havoc in Jerusalem where everyone was having to, to flee for their lives. And yet Acts 8, 4 tells us, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. The church in the midst of incredible persecution, great affliction only expanded and grew. It, it put the message of the gospel in places it would have never been if it hadn't been for this Persecution. It pushed people out of their comfort zones, out of, the, out of the comfy confines of Jerusalem. And the Lord worked in greater ways. Persecution has never destroyed God's people. In fact, it's only made them stronger. And what's true of the nation of Israel, what's true of the church in general, is also true for you and I on a personal level. God uses it. Now, we just wish the enemy would see that and realize, hey, I'm wasting my time here. I'm moving on. But sadly, that's not our enemy. Right? He doesn't see this and retreat or back off. No, he just angers him. And it causes him to take his wrath to a new level. And that's the very thing we see here. Verse 13 says, so the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. Rigor can also be translated cruelty. It has the idea of crushing. It was more than, okay, let's just put them to work. Let, let's give them hard tasks to complete. 
keep them busy, keep them under wraps. No, now, now let's make them miserable while they do it. Let's put such a load on them that it crushes them. Verse 14, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. So here they are doing this difficult labor of, of making bricks, doing it in the harsh, harshest circumstances, but now doing it in hard bondage. Which think about this. This is so far from the work that God intended for humanity. When he set up Adam back in Genesis to work at tending the garden. This is so far from the joy and the blessing and the fulfillment that God designed mankind to experience in their service of him and taking care of this world. This is what sin brought into the world. This is what the worldly system dominated by sin will do in our lives. It makes our lives bitter with hard bondage. But if this wasn't enough, the king of Egypt, he had more in store. Verse 15, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. And so the king of Egypt decides, I'm not just going to beat them down. He says, I'm going to take them out. And so he calls these Hebrew midwives together and he gives them the command to kill any Hebrew boys that are born. The girls, they can live. But again, the boys, they were the threat because they could grow up and join the Hebrew army, which is only going to add more soldiers to defeat Egypt if they decide to revolt or join with a foreign nation. And so he gives these instructions to, to two of the Hebrew midwives. And there's some debate out there. Some believe that, that there had to have been more than two midwives, um, that maybe these were kind of the leaders of the group. Again, we don't know that. We are told of these two. And I think it's very interesting when you see what their names mean. Shifra means beautiful one, and Pua means splendid one. The, these women whose names spoke of beauty and splendor were commanded to do that which was ugly and gruesome, the murder of children. And of course, we see Satan's fingerprints all over this, don't we? Again, we go back, as we mentioned before, back to the Garden of Eden, where God told Satan, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And as we saw in Genesis, from that point on, Satan began to destroy that seed. And countless times. And here is one more attempt. Because if all the male Hebrew children are destroyed, then there is eventually no opportunity for the promised one to come. You wipe out the nation, you wipe out the promise. And just as Revelation 12 tells us, the dragon was there when Herod gave the command for all the, the Hebrew boys two years old and under at the birth of Jesus to, to be killed. You can guarantee that that same dragon was right there when the king of Egypt gave this command. But here's the good news. At the same time, just as the Lord worked in the heart of the Magi at the time of Herod, we see he was at work in the hearts of these midwives as well. Because notice their response in verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. This is an amazing, bold stand these ladies make. Again, when you consider the condition they were in, things were already hard on the Hebrews. There was no brick makers union that was going to come and get their backs. There was no lawyer they could, they could hire to, to make the workplace a more friendly environment. Pharaoh held all power. Whatever Pharaoh said went. Think about how easy it would have been to, to compromise in this moment so that we don't think, make things even harder on ourselves. You know, maybe if we give in to this demand, maybe he'll back off 
on some of this other load he's putting on us. And I can imagine how easily you could rationalize this compromise by thinking, you know what? It's probably better not to bring kids into this environment anyway. It's probably better that these pregnancies don't come to fruition. I mean, look, look what these kids' futures are going to be. Look, what, look at the society they're going to have to, to grow up in. I mean, this Pharaoh has already shown he means business. And yet with all of that opportunity for compromise and all that rationalization to just support that, these ladies defied this command and they saved the boys. Not because it was socially acceptable, right? not because it was politically correct, but because they feared God. And their fear of the Lord was greater than any fear they had on what they might lose out on. And again, there was a lot to fear about this Pharaoh, but their fear and their reverence and their honor and their respect of their God was greater than any earthly authority. It's very interesting to me. They could work under very difficult and unfair circumstances. They, they could submit to cruel bosses. They could even work hard and make money and provide fan, financially for a wicked man. But when he asked them, what he asked them to do, when, when that crossed the line of direct disobedience to the character of their God, that's when they drew the line. That's when they wouldn't move. And I don't think you can read this and not think about, as you think about the rationale that, that drove Pharaoh in making this decision, I don't think you can read this and, and not think about how that same rationale is used in our day when it comes to the murder of babies through abortion. You think about it, the rationale of Pharaoh was what? The rationale of Pharaoh was for the sake of the nation, for the greater good of Egypt, for our prosperity, there are some lives that need to be removed so that we don't take away from everyone else. And is that not one of the exact same arguments we hear today? I mean, having a child with disabilities, that, that's going to be taxing on your family. That's going to be taxing on the services this nation has to provide for that child. I mean, if that child's born into poverty, it's going to put a greater financial strain on the government, having to step in and help out. I mean, the world's resources are already being, being taxed. They're, they're already at a, you know, at a limit. We need a level of population control. In fact, I ran across a study. It was reported in the Journal of Pediatrics. This was at the end of 2018, so almost three years ago. It concluded that parents' ability to care for existing children was hampered, and they were in a worse socioeconomic situation when they were denied abortions versus if they were able to receive them. Basically saying, there was a greater chance a person would live below the poverty line and live in a household without enough money to cover food, housing, and transportation if they were denied abortions versus those who weren't. And so the conclusion of the study was, for the greater good, there are some who need to be killed. Now, they didn't use, obviously, that language, but we can call it what it is. And again, from a rational mind, that can sound very logical. Why am I going to take away? I mean, where have we got these kids? We're having a hard time feeding them. It, it, it makes sense for their welfare to not bring more into the mix. But though it may be logical, what it reveals is a fear of lack in this world is greater than a fear of God. Then the one who said in Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It's I who put to death and give life. And so here, even though it can mean greater affliction, greater hardship in their lives, these ladies were willing to stand with their God rather than putting themselves in his place in determining who gets to live and who gets to die. Amazing stand. Of course, it wouldn't have gone unnoticed to Pharaoh, right? Right? I mean, he, he would have realized what was happening here. He looks at why are all these babies still wearing blue? Right? And something is not right, like I commanded it. So verse 18, so the king of Egypt called for the midwives, and he said to them, 
Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Now, this response by, by these ladies has over time caused some problems. Because on the surface, it seems they tell Pharaoh a lie. Their, their, their response is, well, these, these Hebrew women, they're, they're hardy women. They're not like Egyptian women who just lay around all day and pamper themselves and, and watch Egyptian soap operas. Right? They're used to hard labor. Right? And so they go, in, they go into to, to labor and bam, it's done. I mean, babies popped out, they strap it on their back and they're back to, to making bricks. They don't need any help. Right? It pains no problem for, for, these, for these ladies. You can't get to them fast enough. Right? They're like bionic women. Now I submit to you, this could have been true. They could have been telling the truth. That they were stronger. And they didn't need a whole lot of help. And so maybe the midwives purposefully took their time getting to these women. Because they knew they could handle it on their own. And so there'd be no opportunity for them to be there at the birth. So they could legitimately say, I wasn't there. They had the baby and they moved on, so they hear Sarah's going into labor and they look at each other and like, let's just have another, let's just have another cup of tea for a minute, right? Again, we don't know. But all that to say is this could have been the truth. Now, if they were completely lying, some have, have said that maybe the idea is that they were thinking of a higher moral order, that the sin of, of taking a life was greater than the sin of lying. But I think we need to be clear in this, we need to be careful in this, because if this was a lie, this is in no way justification for you and I to live a life of lying, okay? Well, it was in the Bible, it worked for them. God blessed it, so I'm just going to lie to everybody I see to get my advantage. Well, we have to couple this with what Proverbs tells us. Seven things God hates. Guess what's in that top seven? Lying. This, if this was a lie, again, it wasn't for any personal agenda. It wasn't for self-seeking motives. Again, it was out of fear of the Lord. Okay? And so whatever the deal was, we see that obviously they did it with a right heart because God honored them. Verse 20 says, therefore, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. Have you noticed the common theme throughout this chapter? This is the third time we read that, that phrase and the people multiplied. Again, back in verse 7, even though they were living in a foreign land, the children of Israel were fruitful and they increased. Even when they were greatly afflicted in a foreign land, verse 12, the more they multiplied and grew. And now here in verse 20, after an attempt at genocide, the people multiplied and grew very mighty. Leads us to a question. Were the Israelites victims? here. Now, I guess on, in one sense, you could say yes, in the sense of they were mistreated. They were taken advantage. They were done wrong. There's no way you can excuse how the Egyptians treated them. But in the greatest sense, I believe what the Holy Spirit is having Moses pen for us is that the answer to that question is no. They were not victims. Because there was a sovereign God overseeing all of their life and taking the worst that sinful humanity could throw at them, taking the worst that the demonic realm could throw at them and using it to grow them and to increase their might. They weren't the victims. They were the victors. And the truth for you and I is that the very same God that oversaw all that came against the children of Israel is the same God who oversees our life today. Which is why as a follower of Jesus, it's not right for us to ever see ourselves or identify ourselves as victims. I submit to you, a victim mentality is not a biblical mentality. We can expect it in the world. We can expect the world to, to, to take that mantle on their shoulders but it shouldn't be found in the church. Not when the Bible over and over reveals to us a sovereign God. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we really believe that God's power is greater than anything anyone can bring against us? 
You know, Paul asked the question in Romans 8. He said, what then shall we say to these things? And the things he was talking about there, you remember, were persecutions and hardship and, and tribulation. Well, what do we say to these things? How do, how do we respond to these things? How do we view our lives through these things? Paul said, here's, how he, here's what he says to these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, there's a long line of people that can be against us and do come against us. But Paul's saying at the end of the day, they don't have the final say. All those things they're doing to me, all those things they're trying to work in my life, all those things they're trying to take from me, you know what? God's just using them to put me further down the road of where he's called me to be, to put me in his will, to make me more like him. There's no victim mentality in the apostle Paul at all. And again, I believe Moses is making that clear here when it comes to the nation of Israel. Now look at the reward God gave. Not only did he bless them as a nation, but look at the specific reward he gave to these ladies for their faithfulness. Verse 21, and so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Now the idea is not that he gave them brand new mansions. The idea is that he gave them children. God blessed their, their stand for his priorities by giving them their own kids. They had protected these other children, and God said, I'm going to bring you your own. God honored them for honoring him, just as Scripture says, 1 Samuel 2.30. But the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. Now, it's important to recognize God's honoring us doesn't mean the difficult circumstances or the difficult people will be gone from our lives. It doesn't mean everything always gets better. It just means that he will make sure to provide for us, to work in our lives. We never can outgive him. I mean, we, we see that here, that the fact that they made this stand, it didn't change the heart of Pharaoh one bit. It didn't, it didn't soften his heart. Pharaoh didn't look at these ladies like, wow, they were willing to defy my command. Wow, they were willing to put their life on the line for these little babies. Wow, I must be wrong. Wow, I must be harsh. Man, I need to, I need to, I need to change. I need, to, I need some, you know, Compassion, counseling, or something. It didn't do that. Right? It actually made him even more intent on destroying their lives. But yet the Lord was still blessing in the midst of it. Now the command would go from just these midwives being responsible to destroy all the babies to now Pharaoh calling on all people. Now it was on the parents to have to destroy their own sons by throwing them in the river. Verse 22 says, so Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, every son who is born, you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And it would be this command that's gonna to lead to the events surrounding the birth, as you know, of one specific Hebrew boy that we're gonna look at in chapter two. And that, of course, is Moses a man that God uses in some of the greatest ways in, 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 all of, in all of history. In fact, Moses, next time, is going to give us his own birth story. That's kind of cool. And once again, we're going to see how God is able to take the enemy's plan for evil and use it for good. Because this very river meant to kill will become the very place that Moses finds life. And God allows him to be brought into the very home of Pharaoh, where he'd be raised and trained up, uniquely shaped to be the very deliverer of the Jewish people that Pharaoh was trying to kill. It's amazing, with each step that Pharaoh sought to stand against God's plan for his people, again, God turned it into a way to, to further his perfect plan, to increase them, to grow them, to bless them, to ultimately provide their deliverer. I like how A.W. Pink put it, he said, better might a worm withstand the tread of an elephant so get that picture in your mind. Better might a worm withstand the tread of an elephant than the puny creature resist the Almighty. So true. And how interesting on top of that that the very way Pharaoh would seek to destroy the lives of the Hebrews by drowning them in water will become the very way that his life will be taken as he'll be drowned by the water of the Red Sea. We'll see more of the story next week. But for tonight, here's the question I leave us with. Are you afflicted 
today? Are you under a, a great burden? I would just encourage us. Allow that affliction to drive you to the Lord. No matter how freeing compromise in the situation might seem right now, continue to honor him and pray that your fear of God would be greater than your fear of your circumstances. And then trust that the same God who grew the children of Israel in, in strength and fruitfulness, though they were planted in the midst of, of the greatest affliction, trust that that same God will do the same thing in your life and that he's no less sovereign today than he was then. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for who you are. The sovereign God, the one who is in total control. Lord, we don't understand why you allow the things you do when you could have stepped in and, and, and stopped this affliction and stopped this bondage, Lord, so easily. But Lord, we know that you used it in a great way in the lives of your nation. And Lord, we know that you work in the same and similar way today in our lives. And so, Father, as much as we would like the affliction in our lives to be lifted, the, the, the weight that we're carrying right now to be taken off right now, um, Lord, what we want more is for you to use it to make us more like you. That's our greatest need. Lord, remind us tonight, you don't waste anything in our lives. Lord, everything that comes against us, you are able to take it and use it for our good and ultimately for your glory. And so, Lord, let us rest in that. God, whether we're experiencing these things personally or as we just, again, look at our nation today in our, in our lives and how our nation is, is, is treating us as your people and the things coming against us and the persecutions, Lord, remind us, Father, that you take all of these things and use them to multiply us and grow us in greater and greater ways. And Lord, that we would rest in you and we wouldn't compromise in the midst of the, the heaviness, Lord, we would stay faithful. Lord, knowing that you will reward and Lord, that your perfect will will be accomplished. So Lord, just encourage your people tonight, minister to us, and we love you and we go out worshiping you tonight, Lord, as our sovereign God. And we pray and ask it all in Jesus' name, amen.